Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining this uh, EGBA webinar, where we will try to present um, our EGBA guidelines that we have come up with recently uh, to that aim to help the online gambling sector essentially do better on AML. Um, we are uh, we have an hour this morning, so let me just start by some how little housekeeping. Um, we have had over 620 registrations, uh, for which we are uh, extremely happy to see that there is so much interest in the topic because it is an extremely important topic uh, and one that will only continue to grow in importance. Um, we have a chat. If you would like uh, to ask a question, please use the chat function and we will try to do our best to answer your question. Um, we, have a, we have four uh, very interesting speakers today. So I'm sure that there will be interest to ask questions and we'll try to do our best. Um, this webinar is also going to be recorded. Uh, so if you would like to send the recording to someone else, uh, the recording will be available as of tomorrow um, in your email um, account. So um, without further ado, uh, we can, um, I just want to quickly present EGPA and our members. Uh, these are just some little figures um, that tell a little bit the story about uh, who EGBA represents. Um, we have our members have a total of 225 online licenses across 21 European countries, and we're serving all close to 30 million customers. Um, next slide, please. So this is the agenda for today. Um, my name is Ekaterina Hartmann. I've been with EGBA working in the gambling sector, including on AML for nine years now. Um, I will uh, present uh, more in detail our speakers once we start the panels. Uh, and we're going to have two panels. Uh, one uh, is more going to focus on two of EGBA's members' views uh, on our guidelines. They were both very active in the drafting of those guidelines. Um, and we would like to hear more from them about how, not only how they view the guidelines, but also how they're going to be implementing them in their internal processes. Um, then we're going to have a second panel, and here we have invited uh, two regulators. Uh, from um, uh, from Sweden and from Malta uh, to talk to us uh, about their experience with their own guidelines and about their views about the EGBA guidelines. Obviously, we're going to touch on a lot of other topics uh, today uh, and not exclusively the guidelines because there's just so much to say uh, and so many related topics. Um, but um, we are also hoping that our, um, you know, that we were, we're going to have an interesting discussion potentially in between the panels as well. Um, so just a couple of very short sentences uh, to present to you the EGBA guidelines. Um, the EGBA guidelines are a project that started probably already, um, the idea for it started around three years ago. And at the time there was very little practical guidelines in the EU about how to do AML. We obviously had the fourth AMLD, we had the fifth AMLD, um, and, but um, there was still, what was still missing was how do you, how do you as an AML professional tackle AML challenges in your daily work? So we said, there is the Maltese guidelines. There was also just at the time the Netherlands were going to issue their uh, guidelines. And then after that, we had other member states as well issuing guidance, such as Sweden and Denmark. But at the time when we started doing, uh, when we had this idea and we said, listen, we just, we as an industry, we want to do better. And this is something that I have consistently been hearing from our members. 
um, that on AML there we're doing a lot and we can always do better. And how can we better do uh, tackle our daily challenges than have a sort of um, toolbox, a, a little rule book that helps um, tackle concrete scenarios? because there is a lot, a lot of guidance for banks in the EU and for payment institutions, but sector specific guidance is unfortunately still lacking in the vast majority of member states. So we decided as EGBA, let's, let's try to do something about this. So let's try to, to deal with this uh, guidelines. And from when we started until when we finished, um, there was, a lot of new topics that were coming out all the time. Some of them we're going to touch upon uh, as well. Um, one such topic is, for example, sports integrity, which is increasingly being considered as part of AML. Uh, another such topic is um, um, provisions around cryptocurrency. How should the tax, how should the industry be dealing with um, with the acceptance of crypto as a payment method? So these are just two examples of um, of the fact that AML is constantly changing um, over time, um, and it is changing extremely fast. Uh, at the moment, uh, some of you may be aware that the European Commission is um, uh, uh, European Commission, European Council, European Parliament. They're all working on a new regulation on anti-money laundering, which is going to be uh, much more detailed than what we had in the directives. And it's also going to be um, directly applicable in the member states. So there's not going to be any more any uh, kind of divergent uh, interpretations um, by different member states, of, uh, such as the case was when we had the, a directive. Um, so with we so with that in mind, we also wanted to future proof a little bit the AML guidelines because just repeating what is in European legislation or uh, what is in national legislation is not really the most useful. But what is really useful is kind of looking at specific um, scenarios, always keeping in mind what is important for our sector. Um, so. Overall, another reason why we wanted to have the GBA guidelines was because they can be a tool for us to work better with operators and with everyone in the industry together. Um, because I, I firmly believe we can do more. Uh, and I firmly believe we also all need help to do more. So we really need to work on all of this together. And without uh, further ado, I would like to start the panels because we have a lot of interesting things to cover today. I'm going to just shortly introduce um, our two panelists for our first panel. Um, Adriana Minovic, she uh, is um, Director of Compliance in DPO for Betson Group. Uh, she's a lawyer and she has specialized over time in various regulatory and compliance issues. So she doesn't only work on AML, but also on data protection, IP rights, competition law, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, she comes from um, uh, in, in, interesting industries such as aviation life sciences. But now we have her uh, working on online gambling at Betson um, and uh, the second panelist in that panel is uh, Piotr Lisak. He's an AML governance officer at, at Kindred Group, and he's also DMLRO for the Netherlands, France, and Romania. And uh, Piotr has um, a lot of AML experience uh, as a legal counsel, as a negotiator, as a compliance officer, as an MLRO, also um, in other sectors. So Piotr comes from the financial services sector. And um, he is also experienced across a number of different jurisdictions, such as Luxembourg, Malta, obviously Romania, France, we already mentioned. Um, so we, it would be um, it would be very uh, interesting to hear also some from him some let's say maybe even country specific examples. Um, so with that, um, I would really like to uh, start with the first question. And uh, my first question would be to Adriana. 
Um, Adriana, what are the main challenges that the industry is facing in relation to doing anti-money laundering efficiently and to a high standard? And also, how can online gambling operators show their commitment to fighting money laundering better? Thanks, Cathy. Thank, thanks, everyone. I think it's a real pleasure to be here today. And thanks, Agba, for organizing this webinar, since I really believe that apart from the work that we did on the Code of Conduct, it's equally important also to promote this self-regulatory instrument, I would say, and to, to enhance the awareness around it. Well, when it comes to the our industry, I think it's it's quite typical issue with all newly regulated industry. Online gambling is technically considered as as young industry in the terms of the regulation, and as such is suffering from let's say very common illness of the young regulatory industries, especially when it comes to the horizontal application provisions where we are practically. Uh, put in the same basket as some more traditional industries such as banking and financial institutions and maybe applying certain provisions that that uh, that are a bit out of the context when it comes to the online gambling industry. Uh, that's why I would say that the blanket approach is definitely something we, we, we should try to avoid, especially when it comes to the AML and that's why it's such an initiative at this code of conduct and other self-regulatory mechanisms are extremely important for us to better understand our industry, to show the specifics of other industries, and to explain how the horizontal regulations such as AML should be applied in, in this specific case. Um, for that reason, I think that the code is quite step forward. As, as you explained at the beginning, in certain countries, yes, we do have a certain guidelines that are issued by the regulatory authorities, and that's something that, that is very important for us in the industry, but unfortunately, the situation is not the same around the globe, and that's why we thought that this idea of industry bringing the code that would explain practically our view when it comes to the AML is something that, that we find very important. Thanks very much, Adriana. Um, Maybe we turn to Piotr. Uh, Piotr, how is de risking being done in the industry? Um, we, we have our guidelines now, and hopefully, they can help to demonstrate the credibility and involvement of uh, the key industry players in mitigating uh, such de risking risks. Um, how can the EGBA guidelines really help in the fight against money laundering? Of course. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, all thanks very much, uh, Kay, for organizing the webinar. I think it's uh, very good that <clears throat> we as an industry uh, can set up the standards which uh, were missing before. And regarding the risking, of course, um, uh, this has, uh, let's say, implications uh, in various areas. We can speak about uh, geographical uh, the risking. So we have some member states, even in the EU, which let's say view the industry as way more risky than it really is in terms of regulated uh, licensed entities, of course, as well as we have certain uh, other industries which may view our industry as uh, more risky than it really is. So just to say, uh, one example uh, about the banks. I mean, not all the banks uh, would like to cooperate with uh, gambling companies, uh, either as uh, payment service providers or uh, even uh, for the employees of, 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 of the gambling companies. So let's say we all, let's say uh, we can all face uh, the risking challenges uh, posed by uh, approach of other entities. Of course, just example of the banks, uh, we may not uh, have the bank as a counterparty just because, let's say, dealing with the gambling industry will be outside the risk appetite. And I think the guidelines would really help to demonstrate to other industries uh, that we keep very high standard, that we are actually already kind of a mature industry, which uh, is also regulated. And in fact, the perception of the risk posed by the gambling industry is incorrect. and. Uh, we hope to spread that awareness uh, among uh, other players, as well as uh, make it more uniform across the EU. Uh, touching on uh, as well um, about these differences in different EU member states, uh, I mean, 
I think uh, the move uh, which you mentioned uh, to the regulation at the EU level would also benefit uh, kind of our industry because we'll have equal standards applied across across the whole block. So hopefully, uh, for, for, let's say the risking challenges will be uh, way less. Just to say also some practical the risking um, example from uh, for, which can happen to, to 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 someone who you know has uh, links to the gambling industry. We may face situations whereby even an individual. Uh, can have problems, or maybe not problems, but let's say, then enhance due diligence uh, on 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 uh, on them, just because uh, someone is linked to 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 the gambling industry, even not as a senior person. So let's say it has it has uh, f f huge implications, and the guidelines. Uh, I mean, all other sectors, let's say the major sectors, have already their own guidelines, uh, self-regulatory bodies. And uh, I think it is also good for the sector um, uh, in the large sense because uh, for, uh, we set we set these standards uh, which uh, basically would uh, demonstrate to the authorities and uh, and and other players in the market uh, our commitment to to fight against uh, money laundering, terrorism financing, and that we actually, in practice, from my experience. Uh, gambling industry in, on many occasions applies higher standards than, for example, uh, it used to be applied by the payment service providers. So this is my view on, on, on the issue of the risking. It will really help. Thank you very much, Piotr. Indeed, um, there, uh, there are a number of member states, uh, specifically, let's say Belgium comes to mind, where there are um, really issues with access to banking services and uh, one of the things which uh, which should be considered is that as banks uh, who are supposed to be the most secure um, entities for AML purposes when they are de-risking and actually refusing uh, clients then potentially uh, clients are forced to use less secure um, payment service providers, which in the end can lead to a higher risk for AML. So it's exactly the opposite of what we are actually trying to they, we're actually trying to achieve. Because everyone should be fighting money laundering together, and not on a piece by piece approach of what what we prefer to do for our industry in a way. Because criminals, they will always find the weakest link. Precisely, I totally agree, and especially uh, uh, you know, going to these, let's say, less regulated uh, payment service providers. I mean, operators may be pushed to deal with uh, you know such providers which are based outside EU, maybe not uh, meeting you know the equal uh, standards in terms of AML. So this is kind of you know um, a bad thing because uh, the industry somehow can be pushed into this gray zone where we don't have uh, the same standards. Exactly. Uh, hopefully also the um, new anti-money laundering authority, AMLA, that is currently being discussed in Brussels, uh, would also be one to take this issue upon itself in the future. Um, and we're talking about probably um, not the immediate future here, so I don't want to put <laughs> uh, put anyone's hopes up too high. Uh, but it's something that that we will be um, that we will be anticipating maybe in the medium term um, to to put forward uh, there. Um, so moving uh, maybe on that, the next question is actually both for Adriana and Piotr because um, every single operator has different um, internal procedures. So maybe just um, what? how do you think you and your colleagues are going to work on implementing the EGBA AML guidelines in your internal processes? Um, do you foresee any uh, particular uh, challenges? Um, just to mention that the EGBA guidelines um, we foresee the option um, there that every year where our members are going to be doing a uh, report to self-assess on how they have been implementing the guidelines. And on the basis of this, we'll also be considering um, whether they need to be updated and in what kind of ways. So um, maybe Adriana, can you could you start? Yes. Well, uh, 
Katie, I would say that for us, the perspective is a bit different because uh, as, as Piotr knows as well, we were one of the, of the members who were actively contributing to drafting of this guideline. So I would say that within our small working group that was working on the drafting of the guidelines, we practically bring to the table our experience of already implemented mechanisms and practically try to brainstorm what would be the best approach because we have a different methodologies, different approaches, and try to see which one would be definitely the most viable and the most effective for our industry in general. Also, being as the operator who operates already on more than 20 countries, both in EU and non-EU countries, we believe that this uh, experience from other countries and how we deal with the other countries is also something that should be taken into account when drafting these guidelines so they can be applicable uh, not just in the EU, but also serve as a model for the for the for the members who would like even to apply them maybe in in outside of the European jurisdictions as well. So in that sense, what what I would say that I'm looking forward definitely is the first reports that we will produce in a year time, where we will practically try to see, of course, how we in, into the details implemented these guidelines on each specific operator's level, and maybe have a better idea how the implementation really works. But I would say that as far as from this point of view, um, we are quite in line with the current guidelines because this is practically the experience that we brought to this table. Thanks, Adriana. Piotr? Uh, exactly. I must here concur uh, with Adriana that basically uh, we were um, quite heavily involved in uh, these uh, guidelines uh, during the working groups and um, these guidelines are the result basically of our experience. So, you know, as big organizations, regulated organizations, we already had, uh, for, let's say, strengthened procedures um, uh, in terms of anti-money laundering, uh, anti-terrorism -ter financing. And um, in this sense, uh, our policies are covering uh, these aspects which are listed in the guidelines. A good part about the guidelines is that they are okay, not so detailed in the sense that they would not uh, enforce, they would not uh, force uh, an operator to actually develop a very specific process uh, without uh, any flexibility, but they set out the um, uh, set of rules, which uh, let's say should be standards in the industry. So while the specific implementation may differ from operator to operator depending on the proportionality uh, of the operations as well as uh, of course uh, the, the, the the geographical area of operations the types of products offered still will have at least the backbone which uh, which will be like guiding pure, pure principles in preparation of the policies so in our case uh, if we can uh, even list things like uh, the procedures uh, even business risk assessments, uh, customer um, uh, risk assessments, the, these principles are already there, of course, and they are constantly being improved. Thank you very much. Um, show, uh, Adriana, question, another question for you. Um, what do you think, uh, how do you think, I mean, we heard from you about kind of how, how you are going to be implementing the guidelines. But um, what do you think about the uh, kind of the wider industry? Uh, do, you, do you think these such kind of guidelines are useful, uh, particularly in jurisdictions where there is no guidance? And are there some specific aspects, maybe topics or provisions in particular that you think are particularly would be particularly useful and uh, other gambling operators should really uh, look at those um, when uh, tr when trying to potentially use the EGBA code? Um, what would you what would you identify as the, as such interesting aspects? Yes, definitely. I mean, the, the the idea how we even approach the guidance is exactly this. I mean, we had to develop certain methodologies in the approaches on the markets where we operate, especially where there are no guidelines as such. And therefore, we try to identify based on these gaps that we noted in our experience, what would be maybe the main topics that other operators would be interested to see in the document, such as this one. So I do believe that there are quite a lot of topics that will give a bit more clarity to the operators, especially the smaller operators who are just entering the markets and maybe struggling with understanding how to implement and apply uh, guidance is 
especially because in AML as any other compliance area, the, the risk-based approach is practically the basis of everything. And risk-based approach is really up to each operator to define how it would be implemented. That's why I believe that in such areas where there is a lot of flexibility for the operators to explain their approach, it's very crucial to have a certain guidelines. So for that reason, I think that, especially as Piotr mentioned, the provisions about the business risk assessment, for example, will help a lot of operators to understand, at least to give some vague idea how to identify the, the key areas of the risks that we believe are quite common for our industry that you can see across all other markets. Then that doesn't mean that these are only risks that you will face in the specific market, but at least can give you certain guidelines. Also, what to take into account when you calculate board inherent and residual risks, how you define inherent and residual risks, because although this topic seems maybe quite obvious in some bit more advanced jurisdictions, I have to say that in certain jurisdictions there are still novel concepts and you, I can see a lot of players on the different markets struggling still understanding uh, these concepts. As well, the same go for the, for the customer risk assessment, which is one of the key tools for us as the operators to, to practically um, analyze and capture our AML risks. So we provided a bit more guidance on the different types of the, of the risks that we can see in the customer risk assessment and also some very common types of the risks that are specifics for our industry. Also how to understand uh, the different risks that comes with the different gaming products, which is quite specific for, for our industries. And maybe I would also highlight one of the areas that is not really so present in so many AML uh, uh, jurisdictions where we apply AML, but it's outsourcing and reliance, which is also sometimes very lightly touched upon in certain jurisdictions and still raises quite a of concerns for, for the operators. And that's why I think the, the guidance that we provided, bit, although it's still quite general, it's good for, for starting point when we understand our contractual relationships with the third parties and different providers in the different jurisdictions and how to approach them. And also, I think one of the uh, very important uh, topics that for sure it uh, it's brings added value for these guidance is that we try to explain at least um, on the high level certain specifics of our industry that should be taken into account. The, the issue of having one account per brand, the purpose and uh, of the business relationship that is quite self-evident in our industries, our relationship with affiliates when we speak about third party engagements and also the relationship with uh, responsible gambling and uh, match fixing issues that you already mentioned that I think are quite interlinked in our industry. So in that sense, I think that they do bring quite, quite an added value to our industry. And as, a, as I explained at the beginning, I think these kind of instruments are really crucial for any heavy regulated industry because heavy regulated industries are the ones that are suffering more, most with horizontal application because in this kind of industries, the rules cannot be applied in the same way. It's always very important to take into account industry specific issues. And that goes for any compliance area, not only AML, that goes for data protection, for any other compliance area. And that's why it is really important for the industry to bring this knowledge to the table and as well to discuss it with relevant regulatory authorities, how to find the most viable way for, for the implementation into the sectorial rules. Thank you very much, uh, Adriana. You covered a lot of the uh, a lot of the interesting uh, specificities there, and um, I want to turn on uh, to build on that to ask uh, my next question to Piotr, which will be about crypto because uh, crypto uh, is a very hot topic here in Brussels. Um, so, Piotr, how do you think cryptocurrencies will impact the business in the future? And what are the various approaches uh, that you're seeing at the moment uh, in relation to crypto by our industry? Um, and uh, you could, if you could elaborate also a little bit more about how the EGBA guidelines approach this topic. And in general, do you think uh, that's the right industry approach? Mm -hmm. Of course, thanks, Kate. <clears throat> so uh, basically, uh, we can see uh, two different approaches, let's say, depending on the location of the operator. From what I have seen, uh, there are already uh, operators located outside the EU, of course, which even advertise uh, acceptance of crypto as means of payment uh, to the play account. So this industry, I mean, this uh, kind of approach 
is already uh, in place, but not, let's say, so much into the regulated industry as we are. From the European perspective, I think uh, the cryptocurrency uh, and the payments by cryptocurrency is still uh, in its infancy. So uh, most of the operators, the majority, do not accept uh, crypto as means of payment uh, for, for depositing uh, or even uh, withdrawing from, from the play accounts. So moreover, uh, certain authorities uh, would explicitly limit the use of crypto and of course prohibit uh, the operators from actually using accepting cryptocurrencies as means of uh, of payments and uh, my personal view is that of course cryptocurrencies uh, have a huge potential in few years time to actually be uh, more widely accepted so far we have just seen i think it's uh, maybe antonio can also touch on this in the next panel more uh, as part of uh, malta license there is this uh, kind of uh, possibility whereby operators can experiment with accepting the cryptocurrencies as part of the regime uh, but uh, I don't think it's uh, so popular at the moment uh, yet. I think there are various challenges because um, uh, in recent uh, in recent uh, months uh, we have had uh, the EU uh, legislation regarding uh, crypto uh, being discussed and finally finally approved. And uh, I think as an industry we could face various risks uh, connected to crypto. First of all, if uh, an operator is found to act as a crypto exchange. And in this case, of course, we would qualify under completely different regime, different licensing requirements and uh, different duties as well. Then, of course, uh, for the product itself, uh, one can imagine uh, what would happen in terms of licensing uh, in different jurisdictions if, for example, uh, an operator would introduce, uh, I don't know, tokens or for the, some sort of virtual currency, which is which is which is uh, applied in different products. So you, we can imagine, for example, poker game where you where you have uh, I don't know some skins or some some additional things which you can actually buy with the virtual currency if this qualifies as cryptocurrency if this will be qualified as token there are completely different regulatory regimes so there are different duties so this is um, i would say an opportunity but also a risk for the industry and i can see that this change uh, if it happens let's say it will be gradual and uh, let's say it will not uh, be in a foreseeable one two years uh, that the industry will switch let's say to wide acceptance of cryptocurrencies and uh, this also poses of course um, uh, additional risk because as part of our business risk assessments of course these are the live documents as well so we would need to investigate uh, you know the potential impact we don't have a data from beforehand so this is also uh, a challenge for the industry to actually properly assess the risk there are some tools which are available, especially you know some providers which would enable to track the crypto wallets and uh, the, the chain of transactions. But the primary uh, worry from my side is that crypto transactions would make it very difficult in many occasions to actually determine the source of funds uh, if we even analyze the crypto statements. We have various digital wallets. We have various providers based in different jurisdictions. And what is good about uh, the EGBA guidelines here is that we contain uh, some basic recommendations about uh, how to deal with this topic if uh, a player in the industry would like to accept crypto as means of payment for example so dealing with the eea regulated established um, uh, crypto exchanges not uh, uh, pay payment service providers so not to go to, to some parts of the world where maybe the aml standards are not that high so for at least european customers we would go with uh, with um, the eea based uh, based um, uh, service providers 
of course, I mean, depending on the license in other countries, we would need to take some sort of benchmark approach, I would say, you know, against like the EU regulation as a gold standard. And let's say how much our risk appetite could go go into, into, into this. From Kindred perspective, I can uh, uh, say that we do not have currently plans of uh, accepting crypto or, you know, making uh, wider use of cryptocurrencies as this is still, you know, beyond our risk appetite and uh, also commercial appetite at the moment. But what I can see from practice is that there are some payment service providers, um, especially e-wallets, which are already, let's say, widely used in, in the industry and which can be funded uh, via crypto. Of course, it's not direct uh, funding of the play account with cryptocurrency, but this is sort of additional challenge uh, from for, for an AML professional to actually determine uh, how far should we go and how deep we should investigate and um, uh, basically is it uh, the same as funding your e-wallet with cash? Is it the same uh, or maybe it's uh, a lower risk after all because somehow you can track uh, the transactions through the crypto wallets and there's some level of due diligence done at the, at the point of a crypto exchange. So I think the guidelines um, uh, and the specific section uh, about the cryptocurrency uh, is a good first step uh, to actually ad start addressing the the issue of crypto in in, in in the in the gambling industry, and it gives uh, some uh, general ideas what would be the benchmark uh, if someone if uh, some operator wants to um, st st start using uh, crypto as a means of payment. And I think for the future, this will bring uh, also added benefit that it's a starting point. So if uh, if the industry if the industry uh, uh, moves into crypto, I mean. Kate uh, would, uh, of course, um, uh, agree with that, that uh, the guidelines are the living documents. So perhaps in the future, we'll revisit the provisions and uh, include uh, more findings. So far, the data is quite scarce, and I don't think uh, even the EU Commission would have, let's say, the, the full complete overview of really what the impact would be. Thank you, Piotr. Um, we actually have, um, so we're out of time, but we've had five questions from the audience. So I want to pick one uh, and um, please Adriana or Piotr, if you would like to take it, go ahead. It says, would it make sense to have templates for the business risk assessment and customer risk assessments per sector for our industry, uh, which is something that other industries have not been successful in coming up with? Do you think that's realistic? Well, to be fair, I mean, on one hand, this is what we were exactly trying to avoid for the simple reason to allow certain flexibility to the operators. We believe that giving a guidance how to approach from the methodological point of view business to business risk assessment would be enough for the operators to develop their templates because we do believe that in the end of the day, each operator should develop the templates based their structure of the organization, their other methodologies they use, maybe other processes that they have in the broader compliance process in general, because as I said, risk assessment is inherent process to any other compliance area, not only AML. And that's why we didn't want to limit the operators in that sense. I agree fully with, with, with what Adriana says. Also, this runs uh, another risk. If there would, if there are templates available for the industry, we run a risk that you know, okay, templates are. This is a very organization-specific process, business risk assessment. So each organization would have different level of exposure to different risks. And if we prepare a template and it's taken without real, real assessment, I don't know, by some new uh, small operator, of course, it will not be adjusted to their type of business because they may have different products, different scale of operations, different, you know, this is a quantitative and qualitative assessment, so different data. So I would say um, making such template, templates would be counterproductive for and uh, run a bigger risk of actually making mistakes uh, for, in this assessment. Okay, thank you both so much for your contributions.
Um, we're going to move on to the second panel in view of the time. Uh, so I would like to present to you Antonio Zerafa, who is the head of financial crime compliance at the Malta Gaming Authority. Um, Antonio has worked there for more than seven years uh, on AML, but uh, also gambling related crime, criminal culpability, sports betting integrity, which is a new hot topic. Um, Antonio has a master's degree in computer fraud and counter corruption studies uh, from the University of Portsmouth in the UK. And he also has a degree in criminology from the University of Malta. Uh, and uh, Antonio, you're currently doing a PhD uh, in law and criminology in the UK. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that will be successful for you. I know how hard it is to do a PhD. It's, it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's an extremely rewarding, but extremely tough process. Um, and uh, our other speaker today is Mr. Mr. Frederick Lindquist, who is an investigator at the Swedish Gambling Authority. Uh, he has a background in the banking sector and extensive experience with working against financial crime, both at the strategic and an operational level. He has been with the Swedish Gambling Authority since 2018, so he already has a lot of experience, uh, which, which, which he will share with us today. Um, um, Frederick has a bachelor's degree in economics. Um, and also represents the Swedish Gambling Authority in the Swedish National Risk Assessment, um, which is a very, um, it, which is a very also current topic at the moment. Um, uh, also, um, Frederick is experienced in multiple jurisdictions such as Luxembourg and Malta in relation to exposure to different legal and regulatory regimes. So. Um, Thank you both very much for joining us uh, today. Um, I will start with the first question to Antonio. Um, Antonio, the Financial Action Task Force, so the FATF, uh, it recognizes that public-private partnerships are really crucial in the fight against money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, from a regulator's perspective, and also a regulator that is very much always forward looking and trailblazing such as the MGA. Um, do you think that such partnerships are indeed vital? And um, do you feel also that the sector specific guidance in the remote gambling sector plays a role in strengthening such public private partnerships between supervisors and operators? Yeah, so Katie, first and foremost, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Ekba, and it was also a pleasure to um, together with the local FIU in Malta to, to provide feedback to, to, to these guidelines, uh, even when they were at, at, at the rough stage. Also, thank you for the introduction. You've, you've done it much better than, than, than I would have done. Um, regarding your question, Kate, um, as you rightfully noted, the FATF has from time, time and time again emphasized on the importance of, of public-private uh, partnerships. Coincidentally, in fact, um, I was scrolling through LinkedIn the other day, and just two days ago, FATF had, in fact, once again, spoke about the importance um, of, of, of this partnership and also, in fact, shared the link um, uh, to a web page of theirs, which consists of resources directed towards the, the private sector. A web page which consists of guides, consultations, webinars, and, and other guidance also. So, of course, seeing how the global money laundering and interest financing watchdog leading the fight against um, financial crime, not only speaking about the importance um, of public-private partnerships, but itself providing specific guidance to, to the private sector. And with that said, of course, it is obviously evidently clear that provisions of sector-specific guidance is not only a nice to have, but, but uh, indeed a necessity. Um, on the other hand, from a regulator's standpoint, to, to answer your second question, first and foremost, the provision of sector-specific guidance does indeed uh, paint uh, a more realistic picture of regulatory expectations and obviously, of course, compliance obligations, which as a result, this allows operators to better understand their responsibilities, be more aware of how they can uh, collaborate with the regulators to address a multi of risks, and at the end of the day, um, uh, allows them um, uh, allows them to instigate, of course, their, their processes in, uh, um, in that regard and puts them in a, po in a position to, to better collaborate um, with the regulators to address those sector-specific um, MLTF risks. Um, in consequence, of course, this also, um, you may agree that this also facilitates the development of, of risk-based approaches 
which can then be um, tailor-made to the specific characteristics of, of, of the remote uh, gaming sector. So with that said, um, Kate, I, I, I definitely agree that sector-specific guidance plays a role in structuring the public-private partnership. And of course, this is also helping in ensuring that both parties are on the same side of the table and not against each other in the fight um, against financial crime. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, my next question is to Frederick. Um, so we have European and national regulation on AML in the online gambling sector, uh, and all of it starts and ends with assessing the risk. So that's why we call it the risk-based approach. In your opinion, what is the key to effective compliance and uh, managing the inherent risks that are posed by the remote gambling sector? And also, how are these risks um, to be best reflected in national risk assessments? Um, how can we all work together better to fight money laundering? Thank you, Ekaterina. Thank you for your invitation and, and the nice introductions. Um, in our point of view, all operators are uh, gatekeepers. So everything must start with the risk assessment, who must not be a tick in the box. You must do a correct risk classification. And this is in the context of the Swedish regulation. Uh, we think it's really important that we have it in the, the right context. We must also have the modus operandi and know the risk in your national risk assessment. So that is really important. And we think, for example, training is, is, is a really important thing to have. And in the whole organizations, and it must have the training, we think. And even we think that um, you must take a stance of ownership in these questions. Uh, and all part of the chains is crucial. For example, the banks, the payment service provider, and the gambling operator must do their part in the system and not rely on the the shame before. That's our point of view. Thank you very much, Frederick. My next question is going to be both for you and for Antonio. Um, and it also ties in with why we specifically chose to invite Sweden and Malta for the webinar, uh, because um, Malta is, uh, well, one of those jurisdictions who had sector-specific guidance very, very early. Uh, it's been there since 2018. Um, Sweden joined the trend with its own national guidance uh, issued in 2021. So considering that you're both coming from jurisdictions that they that you have your own guidance, um, what is your opinion um, on the impact of such guidance? How can it have, um, what is the impact that it has on the remote gaming sector? And also, um, how does maybe you would like to draw some interesting comparisons um, between your national guidance and maybe those uh, these published by the EGBA? And just what is your overall op opinion on the EGBA guidelines, I guess? Yeah, so if, if I can start, um, uh, Katarina, on, on this. As rightfully noted, Malta has now had sector-specific guidance in this regard, again, also thanks to the commitment of our local FIU in Malta for more than four years now, since, um, as you rightfully said, since 2018. Um, Malta, in fact, at the time was, was one of the first, if not the first, countries which, which, which came up with, with the sector-specific guidance. And obviously, I think all, all the stakeholders involved saw that this was um, a, a very positive um, approach and, and the positive step um, uh, forward. Um, I would say that the impact of such guidance, not just on the sector, but on the overall fight against financial crime, um, was indeed a, a very positive one, um, Katrina. Before, I, I really enjoyed hearing you say um, the issues with respect to, to the risking. Um, and obviously, we all we all agree that a complete de risking approach, if we truly believe that money laundering is a transnational crime, would be, of course, detriment to the overall risk which is posed on, 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 on the group vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis money laundering. So when coming up with such specific guidance, I think Walter sent out a message there that, listen, um, we need to analyze um, uh, the risks and obviously be in a position to 
better and effectively mitigate those risks. And that is, of course, the intention of, 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 such, um, of, of such guidance. Um, looking at ECBAS um, uh, recently issued guidelines, obviously this, again, it was an important development in, in, in promoting best practices in the remote gaming sector. While it's not legally binding, um, the ECBA guidelines do provide a valuable resource for, for operators, as, as was also mentioned by, by, by other members of the panel from, from the private sector. Um, valuable resource that helps operators enhance their AMS safety procedures and help ensure uh, better compliance in, 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 in this regard. Um, over and above this, I think, um, Katerina, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you will agree that also the publication of such also sends out a strong statement out there, stressing the need for, for more sector-specific guidance from, from member states' competent um, authorities in, in, in this regard. To tackle your last question, uh, briefly, in terms of comparing EGBAS guidelines to those issued by the FIU here in Malta, the ECBA guidelines do take a broader perspective, which is, of course, um, understandable because let us remember that these guidelines are not tied to a specific legislative framework, like the ones, obviously, those found in, in, in the member states which, which have came up with sector-specific guidance. However, it, it, it definitely does achieve what it had set out to do, and that is to fill this existing gap um, regarding the absence of, of sufficient guidance um, across Europe. So, of course, um, and I was happy to see that this was very much emphasized in the guidelines as well, um, whilst any national laws on AML take precedence over these guidelines always, um, I believe that they still manage to go through the most important salient points and in a way which allows operators um, to apply them in terms of their own products that they're offering, the type of customers that they're accepting, um, etc. Yeah, and uh, and we see that this kind of product is, is a really good eye-opener. It, it helps the industry comply with the legislation that we think is really important. We think it has impact. Uh, we, we see in, in the national uh, guidelines, we see that the example of guidelines being included, for example, in the risk is based this assessment that we think is really good. Uh, this product harmonizes with our own guidelines, of course, because it comes from FATF EU and, and the Swedish regulation. But the Swedish guide is more detailed and, 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 and in the Swedish context, but it, it's, it's a good complement and, and it's a good product to see because the operators are in, in a lot of countries. So I think it's good to have a document who, who cover a lot of uh, countries, especially in, in Europe. Thank you both. Um, my next question, uh, Frederick, is to you again. Uh, what is the added value of the guidelines as a way for regulators to help operators comply? Um, have you found, um, and also your own experience uh, after Sweden issued uh, guidelines, uh, did you find that maybe there were stronger trends uh, both of compliance, uh, of correct compliance, but also trends of remediation um, after your guidelines were published. And also, how do you how do you think um, the success of guidelines should be measured? Yeah, thank you. I think it's uh, what we have seen after our guidelines 2021 is that, like I said, they have taken in them in the business risk assessment. Uh, uh, they are they are following them and, and uh, one good example and it should be, uh, every time have good example is that the reports to the FIU in Sweden have increased from 1,400 reports to almost uh, double up the reports with good quality and and, and that I think is a good sign that that that. that uh, the guidelines have some impacts on, on, on the operators. So that's a good example. I think it, it's it's a, it's an eye opener. You understand it better. You know the risk, and, and you take a responsibility to fulfill the obligations when you have guidance to 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 to, to in in your work. Thank you very much. Um, next question for Antonio. Um, we I mentioned two kind of uh, newer issues in AML. One was port integrity and one was crypto. 
we talked already about crypto, so maybe just to uh, focus a little bit on sports integrity. Um, the MGA uh, has a special unit uh, that that deals with that. Um, and it's also a topic that has been tackled in Section 6 of the EGBA guidelines. So what is your opinion of this inclusion? And also, what are the links between match fixing, sports betting, money laundering? Um, it is still a relatively new concept. Um, can sector-specific guidance help ensure operators are aware of all of these related risks? Yeah, thank you, Katrina. Um, so the inclusion of, of, of uh, a section on sports integrity and in, in, in the guidelines was was one which put a smile to, to my face even when, when reviewing the, the guidelines together with my colleagues because I genuinely believe that it is important, timely and justified um, inclusion um, over there. Even if one had to look at the European Commission's recently issued um, supranational risk assessment, one can also see the term match fixing being mentioned around 16 times. And in most instances, um, the mention there is indeed linked to, to, to betting related risks, which goes to show that, of course, the link between sports integrity and the AML is, is one which is indeed merited. Um, uh, the importance of sports integrity is one which, which, which we've recognized quite some time ago. As you rightfully noted, the MGA um, has uh, a dedicated team specifically on sports betting integrity, and this has been the case since late uh, 2019. Um, we also do have in place suspicious betting reporting requirements, which obliges our licensees to report any suspicious betting activity in this regard to the authority. And obviously, throughout these years, using that information, we have assisted multiple stakeholders um, during the past years, including law, law enforcement. Um, also recently, again, recognizing the, 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 the link, the potential link between money laundering and, and, and match fixing, we have also been engaging more with the local FIU here on this topic, specifically, obviously, recognizing the serious and, and potential links between, between such. But even here, uh, Katerina, we did recognize the importance of, of public-private partnerships. And in fact, on a weekly basis, we do share with our own licensed operators events and the corresponding risks that are under our radar so that they can also, from their end, as a private sector, double-check their markets and see whether they are seeing um, any similar suspicious activity in, in, in this regard. Um, uh, considering this specific link, um, uh, Katerina, this is not too easily defined and to cut a long story short, one is because match fixing can be a predicate offense to money laundering or as could be the medium specifically being used um, to launder proceeds of crime. However, on a more practical note, and I will end with this, something which the guidelines, the Akbar shoot guidelines rightfully pointed out, Indications of match fixing, even via the, the, the sports betting markets, should not be automatically taken as an indication of, of MLTF. However, information regarding uh, potential match fixing can be of relevance um, for, for operators AML teams, and therefore operators should um, ensure that they have adequate processes in place uh, to allow for the detection and sharing of, of such information. That might be not only important for their own teams um, within the operator itself, but it could also be very important um, information that needs to be shared to external stakeholders who can then use that data to detect or prevent corruption in sports, and if there is a link, prevent money laundering also. Thank you, Antonio. Um, we have uh, two more minutes, so uh, yeah, we got quite a lot of questions from the audience. I'm going to pick two that are also sort of related. Um, so, if the regulations and guidelines become more harmonized in the EU, what would this mean for the work of regulators and the cooperation between regulators when we take into account that operators hold multiple licenses? Um, and this also sort of ties with the question, how, in, how realistic is for national authorities to endorse such guidelines? or maybe uh, even come up with common guidelines in the future. Why not? We can, we can all dream. Um, I will just, uh, I'm just shooting this question out and uh, anyone that would like to, to give your views, go ahead. 
I, I can give my, my, my very brief view on, on, on this, Katerina. Maybe, maybe the other panelists have, have something to add here. Um, however, it's important to know that currently um, gambling regulation is, is, is not harmonized um, across the EU. And that is why sector specific guidance being issued by, by, by national authorities is, is indeed um, um, important. And obviously, that is why, um, as an MGA, we did support a lot the, the, the ECBA guidelines in this regard. Because, as I previously said, they do try to, to, to fill in this, this um, vacuum. However, something which I think it's a little bit too early to tell is also seeing how the AML regulation and the AML authority would actually impact the scenario um, going forward. Um, because obviously, one would understand that that may have an impact in the way gambling is, is, is also regulated across Europe. But of course, um, in that respect, it's a little bit too, too early to tell. Just, just to add on uh, what Antonio was telling, I think what is important is the continuation of this uh, public and private partnership, especially considering the scattered regulation across EU of the gambling industry. So the more awareness we promote, the more uh, other regulators which are not so active or may not issue any any specific guidelines may start acting as well and once we build this knowledge base it can be a blueprint for other countries to actually uh, take their framework from yeah and i think also the, the collaboration between private and public is, is the way to go here yeah, um, I, I would just add that I think this is the, um, the chicken and egg dilemma that is always present in the compliance and that here we need to be, uh, make the difference between the technical regulations and the compliance. In the very nature of the compliance, it's always to have a certain level of the flexibility. And although on one hand, we as the operators, of course, want more clarity from the regulators, etc., but also we tend to complain when there is a a lot of strict rules because they are not applicable in our each specific environment. That's why I think this thin balance between the being too regulated and having a certain level of flexibility is really important. And for that reason, I think guidances and such as documents are important and they need to be dynamic. They need to be constantly updated through the time, but also leave sufficient flexibility for each and every operator to implement it in its specific environment. Because in the end of the day, that's, that's how the compliance work. It's, it should be in any area, not only in the AML. Okay, well, in view of the time, I would like to thank our panelists for their contributions. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion for me. I'm also sure it was very interesting for everyone that dialed in. Uh, I'm sorry we just didn't have the time to take more questions uh, from the audience. Um, but um, we, we are extremely appreciative that you took the time today to, to speak to us. Um, one l little thing I would like to say before we close is that, um, I mean, we talked about all of these important topics and I think um, it, it's you uh, like members of the industry that are listening to us, but are not necessarily part of EGBA. Uh, it is possible to join the EGBA guidelines as a signatory. Uh, it costs absolutely nothing. It is completely for free. Um, and uh, you could get uh, a lot in return. And um, very importantly, I mentioned already before, we have this yearly exercise where we're going to be really deep diving into how to do AML and how to implement guidance. So there is so much knowledge that can be shared on, on fighting AML um, for our industry in this process that um, uh, it would be, I guess, useful for any um, uh, AML um, uh, team of a gambling operator to join this process. Um, so if you would like to join the EGBA guidelines, please get in touch with me uh, and with EGBA and we'll be very happy to walk you through this process. And with that, we're closing the webinar. And again, thanks for everyone for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.